Hello again, this is Beth Holtzman with UVM Extension's New Farmer Project, and we're back with Julia Shanks to continue talking about bookkeeping basics for farm businesses. On to you, Julia. Awesome, thank you. Um, so part two, we're gonna talk about organizing your system. Um, you already know who I am, I'm Julia. And today, um, part two, we're gonna talk about how we track and why it matters. And to that end, we're gonna talk about a couple of key concepts in bookkeeping. And then we're gonna talk about how to organize your numbers. And in QuickBooks speak, that's setting up your chart of accounts. So you'll remember from the first section, we talked about the first rule of bookkeeping, which is garbage in, garbage out. And you know, we wanna make sure that we have quality inputs into our bookkeeping system so we have quality outputs. The inputs are the transactions, all the little points of data that we enter into our system. And the output is the financial statements, the income statement, the balance sheet, and the statement of cash flows. And if we want good in outputs, we're gonna need a good system for tracking the inputs. And one of the biggest confusing points is the difference between cash and accrual accounting. And you've probably heard about cash and accrual accounting and intuitively maybe you kind of understand it. And a lot of times when people think about bookkeeping systems, they're like, oh my God, accrual sounds so hard and you're gonna get to the end of this and you're gonna be like, holy cow, Julia, that is really hard. I don't wanna do accrual. Cash seems much easier, but there, there are implications of your decision. So I'm not gonna say one is better or the other over the other, but they're different and I want you to understand them. So with cash accounting, we record revenue and expenses when the cash is received or spent. And with that system, there's no accounts payable. Accounts payable is what we owe to our vendors and there's no accounts receivable. And that's what our customers owe to us. With accrual accounting, we record revenue when it is earned and expenses when they're incurred, which is not necessarily when the cash flows. And the goal with accrual accounting is that we want to match expenses with revenue whenever possible. So this probably made no sense. We're going to iterate over this concept a couple of times, so hopefully it makes sense to you. So let's go through a sample, simple business simple sample business cycle. And obviously there's so much more that goes on in your business than these five points, but I'm just distilling it down to the basics to give you the concepts of accrual versus cash accounting. So let's say you go to the hardware store and you buy seeds and supplies on credit and you've been shopping, them for, shopping with them for years, you know the vendor, he says, no worries, pay me in 30 days, great. You get home, you've got a few checks in the mailbox, you've sold a few CSA shares, you deposit them into the bank, you start planting your radishes and your arugula. 30 days later, you pay for the seeds and the supplies. Then 30 days after that, you start wrestling out the first few radishes and you start delivering produce to your CSA customers and your wholesale customers. And your wholesale customers, they don't pay you for another 30 days. So 30 days after that, you receive your payment to the wholesale. So in accrual accounting, you incur the expense when you go to the hardware store and get the seeds and supplies, and the cash flows when you actually pay for them. And that time between you, when you purchase the supplies and when you pay for them, that's called accounts payable. You receive the cash when you sell the CSA shares and when you receive the payment for wholesale, but you earn it when you actually deliver it. So that time between when you deliver the produce and when you receive payment from your wholesale customers, that's called accounts receivable. Your customers owe you money. And that time from when you receive the CSA payments until when you deliver the produce that's unearned revenue. You have the cash, but you haven't done your part in, the, in your obligation to your customers. So in essence, your customers have given you a line of credit. So you have a debt to your customers until you start delivering the produce. So you can see how the cash flowing isn't necessarily aligning with when you earn the cash, when you earn the revenue. Cash accounting is really quite simple in that 
the cash flows out, that's when you record the expense. And when the cash flows in, that's when you record the revenue. So cash accounting is better for tracking and understanding cash flow. If you look back at your bookkeeping system, you can say, oh, that's when the cash flow. I need to, you know, next year when I'm planning, I need to know when is my cash going to flow in and out of my business. Accrual accounting is better for understanding your profitability and your production and work cycles. And let me give you an example of how accrual accounting can really help you better understand your profitability. Oh, and I should say also, um, for those of you who do want to use QuickBooks, you can certainly do both. You can toggle back and forth. You can set up your company for accrual accounting, and you can always run reports on a cash basis. And in terms of QuickBooks, I want to say one other thing. Intuitively, we actually think in accrual accounting. If your clients have not paid you, if you've made a delivery for wholesale produce and your customers haven't paid you yet, in your mind, you're like, yeah, I earned that revenue. I just haven't had the cash yet. So you think intuitively in accrual. And if you're running reports on a cash basis, it's going to kind of throw off your intuition and you're going to be like, wait, that's not right. I, I earned that money. I have cash coming in. My revenue should be different. So, you know, recognize that they're different and how you're thinking about your business and how you're thinking about your numbers really needs to match up with your reporting system. So let me give you another example of cash versus accrual accounting. So let's say back in November, you received $10,000 for a CSA payment for the 2020 year. In cash accounting, you're going to record the revenue in 2019. In accrual accounting, you're going to record the revenue in 2020. Then starting in February, you buy production supplies, you start you know, farming, doing what you do, you spend 30000 in both cases, you're gonna record the expense of 30,000. Then you start delivering produce and meat. And let's say you had $7,000 worth of meat left over from 2019 production that you started um, selling in 2020. You know, it's in your freezer. That's great, you know, sort of steadies out your production flow. Your revenue, you're gonna record the revenue for 60,000 in both cases. But what's going to be different is the year-end adjustments. So in accrual accounting, you're going to say, well, wait a second, I had that $7,000 worth of inventory that I sold in 2020. I'm going to move that over into my 2020 books. And at the end of the year, I also had $10,000 left over of product, meat, or winter storage crops. I'm not going to sell that until 2021. So you move those expenses over into 2021 books. So those are the year end adjustments. So how that impacts what you see in 2020, if you look at 2019, you know, you had some income in 2019 that's really for 2020 and you had some expenses in 2019 that was really for 2020. So it looks like uh, your profit margin in 2020 is 62%. If we line up everything up, even though we received the cash for the CSA payments in 2019, it was really 2020's expenses. And if we move over the expenses associated with a product we're not going to sell until 2021, it changes how we see our expenses. So these little adjustments really impact the way we view our numbers and we can see ourselves as being more or less profitable than we really are. Now, in this example, the accrual accounting made us look more profitable or, you know, reflected a more profitable position than the cash accounting, but that's not always the case. It could be that we had no inventory adjustment at the end of 2020. We sold everything, in which case our expenses would be higher. So it really varies year to year how it's going to impact it, but in terms of really understanding your profitability, you want to make sure that what you earned is recorded in the correct year along with the expenses associated with that revenue. And that's what's going to give you the best picture of your profitability. And as I said earlier, you know, accrual accounting definitely takes more work making these adjustments, whether it's for CSA prepayments 
or for inventory, it definitely takes more work. I'm not going to lie to you, but it is going to give you a more accurate picture of your profitability. Now, if you decide, Julia, oh my goodness, I can't even with that accrual accounting, it sounds like a nightmare. Fine, no problem. But understand the accounting method that you are using. And you know, if you need to make those mental adjustments, make those adjustments, but recognize what you're doing. And when you look at your reports, understand that one system is going to tell you a very different story than another system. So be deliberate. So let me give you some examples of the impacts of cash versus accrual on some more specific examples. So let's say you create an invoice and you, you create the invoice, but you don't receive a payment. If you're running a cash basis profit and loss, you're not going to see the revenue. If you run an accrual basis profit and loss, you will. If you create a bill, if you enter a bill into QuickBooks, let's say, but you don't pay it, on a cash basis, profit and loss, you're not going to see the expense. On an accrual basis, you will. So if you run a profit and loss, you know, whether or not you see various revenues and expenses is going to be directly impacted by cash versus accrual accounting. If you have inventory at the end of the year and you don't make an adjustment, a cash accounting system is going to show a higher cost of production because you're going to have the production costs even though you don't necessarily have the revenue associated with it. An accrual system is going to show a more accurate picture. So that's accrual versus cash accounting. And something like QuickBooks is going to more easily track that for you, but you can certainly make these adjustments within a Excel system or even a paper ledger. Um, oh, sorry, one more example. Um, if you receive CSA prepayments and you don't make an adjustment, your revenue isn't necessarily going to appear in the same year as the expenses, and it could, again, distort your understanding of profitability. So concept number two in setting up your bookkeeping system is that everything has a bucket. And for those of you who are as old as me, you'll remember back in the day when you had uh, shoe boxes to store all your receipts or file folders, and you'd have one shoe box for your utility bills, and you'd have one shoe box for your mortgage payments, and you'd have one shoe box for your insurance payments. And the same is true with our bookkeeping system. We want to have different buckets or shoe boxes um, or accounts to record the different types of transactions. And we'll have direct operating expenses. We'll have things like seeds and seedlings or packaging. We'll have general and administrative expenses, things like our liability insurance or fuel. We might um, have infrastructure investments in our business, such as purchasing a hoop house. And in QuickBooks, this, um, these buckets are called our charter accounts. And we're going to make sure that every transaction goes into its appropriate bucket. So we're going to have some buckets on our income statement and some buckets on our balance sheet. Some transactions we're going to record as either an income or an expense, and we can also record it as a cost of goods sold, which is a type of expense. Um, and then we can get more nuanced in terms of other income and other expenses. We'll get to that in a minute. And some transactions we're going to record on our balance sheet, things like assets, or liabilities if we take out a loan. If we take out a loan and we get cash into our business, that's not revenue, that's a liability. We borrowed money. So we're gonna track that differently than let's say going to the farmer's market and making a sale or delivering produce to a wholesale customer. So before we talk about what to do, I want to talk about what not to do when we set up our chart of accounts. And this goes back to the notion that we want to set this up to make managerial decisions, not necessarily for tax filings. And a lot of people often set up their income statement according to the Schedule F. For those of you who have been in business for a while, you know that the Schedule F is the attachment to your um, tax filings for a farm business, and it recommends different categories of expenses for you. So I call this the Schedule F income statement because all the income and expense categories match up what's on the Schedule F. And it's you know pretty straightforward, it's very concise, it's single layer, 
It's in alphabetical order. It's very easy to read, but it has challenges. And challenge number one is things like grants are included in revenue. And certainly we need to record grants on our income statement or on our tax filings because we've got to pay taxes on it, but it's not revenue. We didn't earn it in the same way. We're not in the business of getting grants. And when we go to do analysis on our business and we're looking like, oh, how much did we spend on feed? Oh gosh, well in 2016, we spent 8% of our total revenue on feed. And in 2017, it was only 5%. Wow, what did we do in 2017? We rocked it. Oh wait, no, we had a grant. Okay, so let's back out the grant and now let's see what did we spend on feed as a percentage of revenue. So by including it in revenue, we have a skewed understanding of how we read our financials. Now, certainly you can back out the 25,000, but it's just one adjustment you don't wanna to have to be making because there are gonna be many adjustments you need to make if we follow along in this vein. Likewise, our expenses are aligned to the Schedule F, but not necessarily to the business reality. So we have feed, which is a direct cost of raising animals. We have veterinary expense, also a direct cost of raising animals. You know, feed F is up here, V, V is down below. Again, we can add it up to understand our total cost of animals, but it's an extra step. With insurance, we don't know. Is this liability insurance, which is a general and admin expense? Is it vehicle ex um, insurance, which you know, is, I would venture to say it's more direct operating. We need our truck, therefore we need to insure our truck. Or is it employee insurance? Is it workers' comp or disability insurance, which is the cost of having employees? And each of these insurances are gonna change in different ways. So we don't wanna just glom it into one bucket of insurance. We wanna make sure we understand what kind of insurance. Similarly, we don't wanna just kinda of glom in taxes. Is it payroll tax, um, which is the cost associated with having employees? Is it property tax, which is the cost associated to be on the land? Or is it income tax, which is, woohoo, we were profitable, we paid income taxes. So very different types of expenses that we don't want to necessarily glom together if we want to understand the nature of our business. So when we set up our income statement and our chart of accounts, we want to be thinking again about the outputs and how is it going to look on our income statement. And I like to organize the income statement in a way that allows me to extract meaning. So top line is revenue. I'm in the business of selling produce, meat, dairy, fibers. What did I bring in through my primary source of business? Now, certainly I may need to report grant income. Maybe I sell um, or rent out space in my greenhouse to another farmer. We will record it, but not here. We want to record in the top line revenue, our primary source of business. Then we have our cost of goods sold, which is uh, produce or products that we purchase for resale. So if we have a farm store, we may bring in somebody else's goods to supplement what we sell. Those are your cost of goods sold. And then we have gross profit, which is revenue minus cost of goods sold. Now I'm going to pause right here because depending on who you talk with, some people may put production costs into the cost of goods sold. And while I have not done that here, I would not argue with that as long as it's deliberate and consistent. I put my cost of production under the general operating expenses under a subcategory of direct operating. So what does it cost to raise a tomato or raise chickens? So I have direct operating expenses, labor, which is the cost of having employees. So not just the salaries and wages, but the payroll taxes payroll taxes and workers' comp insurance. Then there's occupancy. What does it cost to be on the land, whether it's property taxes, rent, utilities. Then there's general and administrative. So things like office supplies, website, certainly you don't need a website to grow a tomato, but you need to have a website to be in business. So general and admin. We have repairs and maintenance. And again, you could argue that that's part of direct operating expenses because, you know, if your irrigation system is broken, you don't have a business. So you need to repair and maintain your irrigation, your fencing, et cetera. 
but I keep it separate just because it's such a big expense and a primary expense for a farm business that I think it's worth calling out separately just beyond just the direct operating expenses. And then there are the one-time expenses. Like if you buy a new fence, you're not buying a new fence every year. And if you, if you were to include it in direct operating expenses, it may skew trends. Because when we look at our financials, we're going to be looking at trends. So having a separate category for one-time expenses helps to smooth out the other categories. And then we have our operating income, which is our revenue minus our cost of goods sold minus operating expenses. And if you've ever heard of below the line, this is where that line is. And below the line, we have other income and expenses. So grants, which we need to record on our income statement to file our taxes. While we're not in the business of getting grants, we need to record it. Depreciation, interest expense. So if you've borrowed money to buy a tractor and you're paying interest, that would also go on your income statement, but as other income and expenses. And then finally, you have the bottom line, which is net income, which is operating income plus or minus other income and expenses. And by breaking it up this way, we can see, number one, is our core operation profitable? Are we profitable raising tomatoes and chickens and beef and dairy? Or is something else driving losses and profits? And can we afford our debt and capital improvements? So if our grant income is putting us into a positive profit situation, then we need to reconsider our operations. We want to make sure our operating profit is positive and we can withstand it without grants. Um, if our depreciation is putting us into a net loss situation, it may be that we've overinvested in our business, that maybe we bought a tractor that we really can't afford. If our interest expense puts us into a net loss situation, we may have borrowed more money than our business can support. So breaking it out this way, we can see is our core operation profitable and is something else driving our profit or our losses. So when you set up your accounts, you know, you want to think about the buckets and the names and what makes sense for you. So some examples of a direct operating expense might be your seeds and seedlings, soil amendments, greenhouse supplies. Examples of our labor accounts would be salaries and wages, payroll taxes. We might also include employee meals, you know, employee benefits or staff housing. Um, if you have an H-2A wor worker and you need to provide housing, or if you have interns, you know, interns, you may say, well, I'm not paying them, so my salaries and wages are lower. But if you have to feed them and house them, that's a direct cost of having employees, whether or not you're paying a salary. Julia? Yes? Um, I have a question. Okay. Um, where would you put um, where would you recommend that people put um, whatever they pay themselves? Does that? So that would be owner's draw. And that is an excellent question. And depending on the structure of the business, they might want to put their owner's draw, they may want to draw a salary to really see the impact of their time on the business. So, you know, and this goes back to what questions do you want to answer? If you're growing your business and you're going to hire people, if you put your labor here in salaries and wages, it can give you a sense of whether you can afford to pay somebody else to do your job. Other people may want to put their salaries and wages in other income and expenses. Um, so they may want to put it down here below um, so that they can see, you know, is a core operation profitable and can they afford to pay themselves? So you can really, you know, depending on the nature of your business, you can put it in one place or the other. And I'm guessing you want to be consistent from year to year. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you do want to be consistent. And that goes back to rule number two and rule number three in terms of you're in charge. You make the decision of where it makes sense for you in terms of your understanding of the business and also, you know, making sure that you're being consistent. And if you have set up your system that makes sense for you, it's going to be a lot easier to be consistent in how you set things up. Thank you. Certainly. So in summary, you want to create a system that works for you. 
you can't measure or you can't manage what you don't measure. So you can't answer the questions about your business if you have not been tracking, you know, what is your cost of production? Well, what did you sell and how much did it cost you to produce it? You need to be tracking these things. So creating a bookkeeping system allows you to measure so that you can manage your business. Using a paper ledger is certainly better than nothing. Um, if you haven't already picked up my bias, I am certainly biased to using QuickBooks. I think it's the best option for most farmers, but certainly paper is better than nothing. And it's a good gateway drug to a good bookkeeping system. You know, do what you feel comfortable with. And as you get more sophisticated, you're going to want to upgrade your system. As you become more empowered by your numbers, you're going to want to know more and you're going to want to sort of move along from you know, if you're starting with a paper ledger, you'll move up into Excel. If you're in Excel, you'll want to move up into QuickBooks. You don't have to start immediately with QuickBooks. Start with what makes sense for you. But as you grow, you'll want to grow your system with you. So in the next section, we are going to talk about QuickBooks. We're just going to do a quick overview. So stick around. We'll see you in a few minutes. And I want to thank you again. If you need more support, feel free to reach out to me or Kelly at UNH or Beth at UVM and visit our websites for more resources.